in the middle? Right here? Yep. Okay. Ooh. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> welcome back. And welcome to our next conference session. It's going to be a panel discussion titled The Future of the Workforce After COVID-19. As we all know, the pandemic has been causing a lot of disruptions, disruptions that have not been seen in generations. Employees started working from home, balancing work with potentially sometimes young children, uh, working sometimes in isolation, having to deal with challenging technology. Employers, on the other hand, had to take unprecedented measures to keep their operations going. Very challenging times. Please, well, please join me in welcoming our diverse and distinguished panel that we assembled for our discussion today to focus on the challenges employers and employees will have going forward. And we will also, of course, focus on workers' compensation issues. But first, let me introduce our panelists. I would like to start with Denise Algayer <clears throat> from Albertsons. She is the Director of Risk Initiatives and National Medical Director for Albertsons Companies. She is a nationally recognized expert in healthcare, workers' compensation, and integrated uh, disability management. She is board certified in occupational and environmental health and case management and an American Board of Occupational and Environmental Health Nurses Fellow. She received her MBA in, in, in International Business and Global Leadership from the University of Texas and her BSN from the University of New Mexico. Then we have Craig Ross. Craig is currently serving as the Northeast Regional Medical Director for Liberty Mutual Insurance. Dr. Ross has over 25 years of experience that includes occupational medicine, health and disability insurance management, and private family practice. Prior to joining Liberty Mutual, he worked as a medical director in the group health insurance industry for Independence Blue Cross in Philadelphia and Aetna US Healthcare in Blue Bell, Pennsylvania, as well as in the group managed disability line of business at Aetna. Dr. Ross, earned his BA in biology from the University of Virginia and went on to study medicine at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Ross is a board certified, is board certified in family practice. We are also pleased to have Dan Allen as a, as a panel speaker. Dan is the executive director for the Construction Industry Service Corporation, Cisco. Cisco is a labor management organization serving 140,000 union building trade workers and 8,000 union contractors in six counties around Chicago. Cisco's primary mission is to strengthen the union construction market by promoting the union construction industry to developers and other end users. Prior to Cisco, Dan was the chief electrical inspector for the city of Chicago. He is also affiliated with the Electrical Contractors Association and serves on several boards, including the WCRI Advisory Committee for Illinois. Also, I am Sebastian Negrusa, Vice President of Research at WCRI. Without further ado, let's start our conversation. So we have a number of questions, and I would like to start with questions about vaccine requirements. Um, and I have a question for Dan. Uh, as, as we know, there have been a lot of requirements for vaccines at the federal level, state level, other local levels. What could be the impact of vaccine requirements as it pertains to employment and also workers' compensation outcomes? No. Thanks for, uh, for having me. Uh, the vaccine requirements uh, have been very well received in the uh, union construction industry. We're very lucky to, um, to have a, a labor management group. So the, the contractors, the employers, meet with all the different 20 different trade unions that represent all the different workers. 
And um, they, have, they have actually had a very strong educational outreach, not really a hammer type approach. And the educational outreach has been very, very well received. Um, we've worked with local, state, and um, officials, health officials, getting the word out, getting toolbox talks. And so um, it's gonna be imperative because a lot of our work is in the healthcare industry. Healthcare industry demands that workers be vaccinated of all types entering there. Some of the schools will. So our workforce knows that their livelihood will depend on it as well as safety is the number one thing. So getting people that were reluctant, you know, this, uh, for, for various reasons, uh, educated has been a huge success. Um, also working, you know, when the COVID first started, it was so imperative that we worked with all different officials. Keeping sick, workers were essential from day one in the construction industry. Try to keep six foot apart when you put that cluster of fixtures up. You need two people holding it. I'm looking out at a high rise, the, the lift that, uh, that brings up the workers. We used to put 40, 50, 60 in to go up and down the various floors throughout the day. Now try to be six foot apart. So we had to scatter work time. We had to work collaboratively to keep people safe. So collaboration is the key. Denise, would you like to add anything else? So I think in, <clears throat> in terms of the impact on employers, the, the you know what's happened over the last a uh, few months has made a tremendous uh, impact and change on the way employers are, are likely approaching the ma vaccine mandate. My personal approach has always been through education and empowerment, and um, that's the approach that Albertsons has taken. We, um, you know, we we did not have a vaccine mandate for associates unless it was in an area where it was required by the state. For example, healthcare workers in Washington, Oregon, and Illinois, uh, those requirements. Um, but we, we put in place a lot of uh, things to help educate and empower employees uh, and, and equipping them with trusted voice, um, you know, people that they would trust and look to. But I think from a, from a national employer standpoint, I mean, it, it, uh, there was a tremendous divide for uh, many employers in terms of employees that didn't want to be, you know, to be forced to be vaccinated versus um, <clears throat> where we are today. And I think the two major things, obviously the federal ETS uh, that didn't, uh, you know, didn't pan out except for healthcare. And then uh, the most recent update to the community's um, um, calculation that the CDC uh, changed just a few weeks ago. And if you're familiar with that, um, you know, the calculation has changed based on three different factors, but the most important thing from an employer standpoint and what you're doing from a mitigation, uh, from your mitigation measures is there's no consideration for who's vaccinated or not. So I think that had a huge impact on what employers were doing or are going to do um, in terms of, of requiring vaccination for their employer, employees. Thank you. So I would like to go back to one of the questions that uh, Bob Hartwig received earlier today, uh, one of those dismal questions, long COVID. So we know there are debates on what is the cluster of symptoms making up uh, a condition that's more scientifically called post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, PASC. Now, as the scientific community is delineating these symptoms, what are organizations likely to do to accommodate many workers that will be afflicted by, by long COVID in the future? I would like Denise to start this and then we'll get to crack. So first I think we have to understand that as of July 2021, I believe the, the ADA is considering long COVID a, um, a, a disability, so employers must understand that and be ready to work with um, employees that may be uh, struggling from long COVID. I thought um, prior to the call, I, <clears throat> or prior to um, our meeting today, I, I, um, I went back on the CDC website to look at the definition of long COVID. And it's called post-COVID conditions, which can have a wide range of symptoms uh, impacting people four weeks or more after they originally inf infected. And let me just read you this so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about. People um, with uh, post-COVID conditions can have ongoing shortness of breath, fatigue, post-exertional uh, post malaise, brain fog, cough, shortness of uh, chest compression, stomach pain, headache, heart 
palpitations, joint muscle pain, pins and needles, diarrhea, sleep problems, fever, dizziness, rash, mood changes, changes in taste and smell. I mean, okay, look at your average claims professional or think about your average uh, claims professional or even clinician nurse case manager working with injured workers that may have post-COVID syndrome, how are, you know, it, it's so important that companies are working with occupational medicine um, specialists, disease, um, you know, occupational disease uh, specialists to help uh, better understand these things. In terms of what we need to do as employers is we need to have programs in place to help work with people that may be struggling with this, including mental health resources, encouraging people to take frequent breaks, and, and um, listening to, to understand, using compassionate listening skills to understand where people are, are coming from. And I think we have to start with the people that they're typically working with in terms of their claims, and that means our claims uh, professionals and, and clinicians, and, and, and helping people understand working with people. It may be, it's not as straightforward as your typical uh, workers' comp claim. Craig, would you like to add anything here? Yeah, uh, so to Denise's point, um, I, I was reading an article yesterday that identified uh, 200 different symptoms in 20 different body systems. I didn't even know there were 20 different body systems, <laughs> quite frankly. But to, to that point, that there are no consensus criteria to make the diagnosis. There's no consensus uh, on how to uh, treat these people uh, in, uh, individually. Um, we have to understand that it is more common and more severe in uh, patients who have been hospitalized, uh, particularly those who uh, have uh, been in the ICU. Um, and uh, there is some emerging science and, and you know, companies are going to need to follow the science. Uh, there was an article that was published in Nature uh, in February that uh, everyone should probably have a look at because it's, it's large and well done um, out of VA experience. Uh, the authors looked at roughly 153,000 people who had COVID. <clears throat> uh, the majority were treated as outpatients, um, about 15 or 20,000 I believe were inpatient. Uh, and were in the ICU, and they compared that group uh, versus a group of five and a half million people at the same time who had not been diagnosed with COVID, and they compared them also to a second control group of five and a half million people uh, from like 2017 that obviously there was no COVID then. Um, and they were looking to see risk of cardiac complications. And what they found was uh, an increased risk across the board for ca ca cardiac complications, heart attacks, arrhythmias, congestive heart failure. Um, most significantly was uh, myocarditis had roughly a five times greater incidence in the COVID patients. So there's going to be more science uh, that comes out. Um, and uh, we're going to need to follow it. Yep. Well, and you were talking about the intensive care unit. There's actually a syndrome now, right? PICS or post-ICU syndrome? Right. So, so, so there's people who have just post uh, malaise from being in the ICU, and then there are others who it's specific to uh, COVID and falls mm -hmm. under that umbrella mm -hmm. of PASC, uh, post-acute yeah. yeah. uh, sequelae. Yeah. I'd like to switch gears a bit and <clears throat> try to focus on the uh, return to work. Many companies have had their employees inviting back into the office or their workplace. Um, what do you think companies should be doing or will be doing uh, to 
to manage the level of discomfort employees might have. Um, and I would like to start with Dan on this one. Well, uh, in, in the construction industry, there's so much uh, <laughs> uh, work from home, it's not an option. Uh, there was a number of, <laughs> number of cartoons of iron workers lifting steel and pouring <laughs> concrete, and the guy goes, hey, look, turn to the other guy, sure wish we could do this from home, like everybody else is. And, and, um, and so the, the ability to do that and yet to keep that old, I mean, we have an aging workforce and a lot of people caring for older parents and that. So when we got deemed essential workers and the entire state of Illinois is closed down in Chicago and we're building, uh, you know, the union is building an emergency hospital at McCormick Place because the IC units are overflowing and they build a 2,700 patient IC unit almost overnight. And these workers, a lot of them are old and seasoned and veteran, and they're taking care of elderly, they got kids, and no, everybody else is sheltered and alone. We're not leaving, we were there. So, uh, so it's important, like the, uh, you know, I know there's a dispute over the, you know, the reputable uh, compensation for the workers' comp at the beginning, but that gave safety to some of these workers to go back because they were getting it. They're, trust me, as an older construction worker, you're up at four in the morning, you're lifting this, you're, you're not going out partying in your community, you're trying to provide for your family, get up and be safe. So there was COVID cases and once one got them, multiple people got it again. We were trying to separate lifts, trying to do all types of stuff. You're, when you're working construction, it's like you're playing sports all day long. You're breathing heavy, you're lifting heavy things, you're inhaling, you're taking your mask off, things in your eyes. And so we did have incidences. So uh, it's important, the employees got together, hand washing stations, scattered job site times. You could come early, work late. Workers and, and contractors working together to solve this problem um, together so that we minimize the, the risk and we were able to maximize people and still able to keep the electric grids running, the water supplies running, the, all the essential. Um, we never, you know, we always knew we were essential workers and then the world found out that we were. So um, it's, it was a good collaboration. It helped increase that safety. Thank you. Denise, would you like to say anything it's else? It's hard here? to come back after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, grocery workers were deemed mm -hmm. essential workers as well. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I put together a clinical team really quickly to help manage COVID and, and um, when we had cases. And all of the, the clinicians that are talking to our employees, one of the things they talk about is, you know, how they are the true heroes. Um, so the grocery worker working in the grocery store, supply chain, distribution centers, they're not working from home. Uh, we do have backstage, tax, accounting, claims, risk management. <clears throat> human resources that do work from home. So we have you know, a substantial um, number of employees that have been working from home. And so the, I, I, the transition plan that we've had in place, again, is to listen, understand where people are, you know, how comfortable employees are. And we have a gamut of things from employees that can't wait to get back to work and those that are quite comfortable working from home. So I don't think there's a one size fits all. It has to be more of a hybrid approach and listening to your uh, employees and, and where they're coming from, but then also balancing the importance of collaboration and working together. So you know, one of the things we're looking at is, is teaming and making sure that when people come back to work that we don't have most of the team off on Friday and, and Wednesday, and then everybody else in there on Tuesday, Wednesday, because then you don't see the, the uh, collaboration. So I think coordinating with your different groups that normally work together so that there is um, balance between um, you know, a hybrid approach. I, I, I don't really see us going 100% back into the office. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see us going, staying 100% remote either. I think there will be a hybrid approach. Craig. Um, I, I think there's not much to have, especially after what, what Dan had to say, but I, I would say that uh, it's important that organi organizations have uh, open, uh, open and honest communication with their employees uh, and, address, and address their concerns about safety. 
Yeah. Well, and, and I think what a lot of employers are doing are surveys. I, I imagine if we had everybody raise their hand or how many of you had to take a survey about this, we'd probably have a lot of raised hands. I mean, and a lot of employers are doing surveys about how you feel about return to work, where, I mean, coming back to the office, how much you'd like to be back in the office, and I think taking, uh, you know, those have to be continual assessments to see where people are feeling. I mean, just, um, you know, a few months ago, we had the, uh, the, a profound spike in cases that we haven't seen in the throughout the entire pandemic that obviously changed probably the way some people feel. So reassessing where your employees are, I think, on a continual basis is important. Okay, great resignation. We got to talk about it. What are the impacts on employees, employers, what could the impacts be also on the incidence of work-related injuries. And what I have in mind is, for instance, situations where various employers are faced with labor shortages, at least in the short run, a higher churn of their personnel than, the, than they are used to. So what would your take be on, on, on this? Um, and I guess we can go with Craig first. Yeah, so um, I, I think that, and I think Dan will have a lot to say about this, but I believe that you know, th there was a shortage of skilled workers. I think there continues to be a shortage of, of skilled workers. Uh, and without people who know the job, particularly in manufacturing settings, uh, there's going to be increased risk, increased injury, and increased more severe injury, so severity uh, will also be up. I think that that's uh, a concern. Um, now, I, I, I also think that business leaders uh, understand the importance of safety, um, both as a primary investment, uh, as well as evidence of having uh, a safe workplace culture. So I think we'll see continued investment in those uh, areas. Dan? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a, a big issue. It's already a big issue in the construction industry. Um, I don't want to sound like an infomercial, but I guess I will. <laughs> but um, so there's two types of construction, and there's the union construction industry, where the, the unions and the union worker take a percentage of their pay out every hour they work and build the training centers. It's the largest privately funded educational system in the country, saving taxpayers millions. So that used to be 35% of our workforce. Right to work for less states decided that, well, we don't need that. So we don't need that training. When every dollar invested in training returns $6 in, in profit to the companies. But for whatever reason, right to work for less states decimate that training centers. There's no lack of apprentice training. The apprentices through, in, in all these trades will have anywhere from 16 to 2,000 on the job trained to get a Department of Labor. So you have a workforce out there in construction that does not have a Department of Labor accredited apprenticeship program. They're not trained in the injuries. This, in, this industry is the most dangerous industry ever, resulting in over 20% of the deaths, workplace deaths in US, and we represent less than 6% of the work. That's only gonna rise as you continue to not invest in worker training, not to think. The collective bargaining agreement is businesses you know, sitting down with labor, saying this is what we want. We want to invest in this, the most, this is how we get all the renewable energies, this is how we get safety. So it's imperative. And add that to the first time in 15, 20 years now, we've got a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. In Illinois, we have a Build Illinois bill. We have a jobs climate bill. So we have more work, and let's face it, with climate change and all the electric cars, we're gonna need renewable energies, we're gonna need all of this construction work, and there will be a very aging workforce, and unless you're training this workforce, you're gonna see more and more injuries and fatalities, and you see that video that we play, that's, that's the reality. Even with the trained workforce we have, we have a mass every Labor Day of the people that were killed in our industry just in Chicago and Cook County, and there's always six, seven you know, fatalities of trained people. It's a dangerous job, so it's important to that we invest in training, real important with this new, and the new jobs bill that President Biden passed, 
invest in the apprenticeship program. He keeps talking about union apprentice training. He knows the value that that's where you make a career for life and not somebody that's just doing a job and going from job to job and sometimes being misused by a, a, a contractor. There's great contractors that do invest in care as much as the workers, and that's what we got to return to. Denise. Repeat the question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> hearing what he's saying about construction workers. So, so the, the great resignation, is, is that going to impact, or has, has it already impacted the labor force, and has there been uh, an impact on employers and on the work-related injuries as yes. well? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what, what are employers going to um, so, address I mean, the situation? So, I mean, as our keynote speaker said this morning, I mean, but the, the, the uh, great resignation started before the pandemic, right? So we, we already had a labor shortage problem. This has just exacerbated the issue. And the risk here is to, you know, be careful not to... Uh, overexert and overwork the employees that you do have because that's what's happening. I mean, you have the employees that are, the people that are working are working longer hours, which is more likely to lead to injuries. So I think the first thing we have to do as employers is be aware of that. Um, do, you know, a risk assessment of the jobs where you've got, you know, high, uh, you know, high safety risk positions where there's more likely to be serious injuries and make sure that you have the processes in place to prevent that because you do have employees that are working longer hours, more days, not taking as much time off. <clears throat> That's more likely to lead to um, not only injuries, but significant injuries. Um, and, and, and in terms of the, you know, um, I, this, this is why you're seeing a lot of employers look at automation and other, um, other ways to improve efficiency um, in anything from, um, if you go to your doctor, how you're processing through the, uh, the check-in process to if you're ordering uh, you know, fast food, I think is what uh, Dr. Hart would use as the example. I don't eat at fast food, but I'll take his word for it that that's what happens. But you know, many manufacturing um, you know plants and, and uh, distribution centers um, are, are moving to uh, more automation or including more automation. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Now, speaking about working from home, a lot of companies will potentially remain in a hybrid sort of a system. Some days workers work from home, sometimes they go into the office. What will that mean for more work from home related accidents, work related accidents? Will there be a compensability issue there? And also, coming from a workers' comp perspective, and how um, work balance can, can be achieved or in, in this new environment, within this new hybrid environment, what would the implication be of more work from home as workers balance their uh, work-life balance and um, how do they deal with potential behavioral health issues and even mental health issues in this environment? And I would like to start with Denise on this question. Okay, so um, in, there, it, there is, there's absolutely going to be work from home injuries. Um, you know, the, the, uh, and the compensability issue, I guess, would depend on the individual state. Um, but the more people you have working from home, uh, there, there's liable to be accidents that happen at, at home. I, I would love to see a, an, an assessment of the going and coming rule with working from home. How do you do that, right? <laughs> so um, the, uh, I think the most important, every, everybody's been so on for the last two years. That's why we have so much burnout. I mean, people are at heightened uh, you know, awareness and attention to work that we've forgotten the, the other part of our lives. So I would say particularly people working in risk management and safety and, and, um, and um, <clears throat> claims you've been, you've been learning how to work differently. And um, so from a leadership standpoint, I think there needs to be um, a, a, from the leadership level, you have to encourage people to, to 
um, take that time, take time off to um, and and have your leadership talk about using mental health services that you have available. That people are balancing many different things. You know, many of our uh, associates are balancing children going to school, taking care of parents, and trying to work um, at home all at the same time. Those are challenges that they've never had before. So having um, a variety of mental health um, resources available to people I think is critical, but not just making them available, but talking about them and having your, your liter leadership team talk about it and maybe share some examples about how those uh, services have been helpful to them. Also, I think using technology, there's different technology solutions that you can use that will uh, remind people to take a break or, or to um, you know, end the day. Although I'll tell you, when I worked at Phillips Semiconductors, this has been a while, but I had a lot of engineers that would sit and work on a project for 10, 12 hours at a time, not stop. And I tried to put you know, a, a system on their computer that would make them do a, a you know, stop and do a, a stretch, and they figured out how to get around it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah, leave it to the engineers. But you know, so you, I think encouraging people um, uh, to take those, um, you know, mental and physical breaks, and encouraging them to be involved in things outside of work. Craig, I mean, not much I can add to what Denise said. A, a few points to emphasize. Uh, I think that we'll we'll see in many industries just increased. Uh, work from home choice or hybrid setups. Um, I think that we're going to have a challenge in terms of what is the course and scope of a work injury that ho happens at home. Um, we'll probably see uh, increased repetitive trauma injuries from poor ergonomic setup. Um, and you know, I think we need to emphasize, as Denise said, the importance of your employee assistance uh, resources, uh, the importance of shutting down at the end of the day. You know, whatever the end of your day is, shut down, go do something else, enjoy your life. Can I add something sure, to that? Please. So I would say, if you if you have a lot of um, you know, we have a lot of claims uh, folks here. If you have you know, people working from home, one of the other tools you can use is obviously you have no idea what sort of setup somebody has at home is using a virtual ergonomic assessment. Um, we've used those tools. And we have like a central hub where people can order things that they need for their home office. But I think making those things available to employees is, is critical and encouraging them to do, you know, participate in, the, in an ergonomic assessment if they're, um, you know, unsure about their, their workspace. What I would like to talk about next is the claim composition. So once a work-related accident happens in the COVID world, have we seen changes in the claims composition? Have we seen changes in the uh, uh, patterns of care, in the treatment pathways, and so on? So I would like to start with Craig on this question. Yeah, so uh, Sebastian, it's interesting. Uh, early in the pandemic, um, if you take COVID claims out of the picture, so minus COVID claims, cl claims composition really didn't change very much with the exception of uh, more severe injuries. So uh, we did see that multiple body part claims had a much greater severity. Now, I don't know if anybody's driven lately. Um, uh, on the way to the airport yesterday, I, I heard a story about how um, pedestrian fatalities is the highest it's, it's ever been. And, and the idea that people just are driving recklessly and fast is, seems to be true. And I think that uh, also increases some of the severity uh, of the work injuries uh, that we see. Um, I think that other than during surges, um, care has been delivered. Um, there was a WCRI study uh, that showed that it compared quarters one and two of 2019 to 2020 um, that really did not show uh, a delay in care. And, 
we think that, that that's what we saw also in practice, again, except in areas where there were great surges. Um, the use of telemedicine uh, ramped up early. Um, it's, begin, it's begun to uh, level off um, and really only seems to be commonly used in certain uh, situations like uh, very big in the mental health space right now. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, thus far, anecdotally, we have not seen uh, a lot of vaccination claims. So uh, whether or not they're coming, uh, I'm not sure. Um, to, track, to track back on something, you know, vaccination seems to decrease the risk of long COVID. And there's been multiple studies that show that. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So tying this back a bit to a previous discussion, a previous question we had on potentially the impact of COVID on the mental health of, of workers, um, be it because of the great resignation, be it because of more stress that workers are dealing with. Uh, we have heard encounters or situations of workplace violence. And uh, I would like to touch a bit on this, and I would like to start with Dan. Well, um, construction sites are known to be peace and love and joy <laughs> normally. <laughs> then you add a little COVID and, uh, and a guy trying to run you over on the way there, and it's just... We just sing Kumbaya, but it's, uh, it's, you know, Sebastian, it's definitely true. And it's actually really, um, it, it's impacted this industry more than ever. And maybe, co I think COVID is going to, um, you know, with all its negative, it's going to come out with some positive. So suicide rates, in the, it will surprise you, suicide rates in the construction industry are the highest of any other industry whatsoever by like as much as four times. It's 53 workers per uh, every 100,000. And you say, well, what's, it, what, what's for that? Well, you're in a, you're in a very competitive business. Uh, foreman has got concrete coming, this, that. The margins are this high. The businesses are, you know, bidding this much profit margin. Right, prices are right. They're all, everybody's under stress. And it's kind of had a, um, a big macho type where 25% of workers that are injured say they don't report injuries. They go to work, they don't wanna be off. They gotta get so many hours for their health care for that year and so many for a pension credit. So the industry itself, again, this is why I love the collaboration between the union contractors, businesses sitting down with labor going, how can we stop this? Nobody wants somebody to, do, to get injured, to get killed or to have this terrible. So they're doing mental health days, they're doing toolboxes. We're doing calisthenics. The, you, the contractor said, yeah, well, you could take five, 10 minutes and warm up. They're paying you while you warm up so that you stretch, just like you would before a football game, for Pete's sakes, when you go climb up 50 stairs because we're separating. We're making people climb instead of ride that lift. You know, I, I don't know, I can't climb 30 flights of stairs, you know, up and down with carrying stuff. So the collaboration is huge in the toolboxes. And the main thing is, and you were stressing on involvement, is to have a foreman that's Joe the tough guy that has to run to work to sit down and say, guys, we need to watch out for each other. We, I, I, we just lost Joe Smo on this job over in the, the when it's not gonna happen. If somebody start talking to somebody, because even though you're at, now you got a spouse at home with three, four kids on the, you know, teaching on, are you on the screen? It has stressed everybody. And then this guy gets laid off because it works slow. And, it's just, you just have to have those conversations. You have to have all, all, all hands on deck. And the professionals are so important to teach this industry because it was a little bit of a slow learner. When you ask somebody to build something like this and build America on their back, you, got, you, know, you also have to teach them how to be compassionate and teach the younger people to be safe and look out for everybody. So we're learning and it's really encouraging to see. And I think COVID will be a, a good teacher. Denise. You know, I, the, in the beginning of the pandemic, we saw this incredible compassion and civility among people, and then people just got tired, right? I mean, and now we see an increase uh, with, with people, you know, getting angry. Um, in the service industry, particularly, grocery workers are putting up with customers that are spitting on them, throwing things at them, um, you know, threatening them because of mask 
mandates that you know the grocery worker has no control over. Um, so those sorts of things, and then you know the the risks that were already there before COVID, um, with robberies and assaults and things like that. So. Um, uh, one of the things we've done is, is had more awareness around how to de-escalate a situation. Sometimes when you're in a situation and someone's yelling at you or you're in the middle of something, you know, the, uh, the human response is to respond with that. It takes more, um, more thought to actually um, step back and not respond to somebody who is escalating a situation. So, and most people are not trained to do that because our human response is to, you know, respond to anger with anger. So, um, training uh, your staff, your um, um, medical professionals, particularly in our pharmacies, on how to react to customers was one of our strategies, but then also offering, realizing that employees are dealing with more stresses now, offering more um, um, mental health um, uh, and services or, or uh, services that would encourage people to use meditation techniques um, to help work through some of those um, stresses that they may be having at work or at home. Um, but I think having more awareness about it and talking about it and having employees empowered and being part of that. One of the other things we've done um, with COVID because many, the whole mask issue is, um, we always tell us, you know, employees do not approach someone directly. So we're trying to pull them out of that situation directly, but it, it, it certainly has um, brought out the, the best and sometimes the worst in, in, the, in the public, so. One sure, quick sure. addition is the, um, the, the use of opiates, you know, for the, for the injuries in construction and all the opiate, and the, the WCR has done amazing, you know, studies and jobs and the medical, um, in, you know, facilities have looked at this and found alternative ways and, and because that is such an addictive thing and you want to go back to work and you're going through the pain and you, you end up and it's a very little bridge between using the medication safely, addiction and depression and other outcomes. We have a few more minutes. So let's try to end on a more positive note. <laughs> <laughs> so back to a point then you made about um, safety precautions that are here to stay. Would you like to elaborate a bit on yeah. what we learned from COVID and what we can do better as, as we hopefully will get out of right. COVID? I, I think there's a lot of positive. So uh, the contractors and the union working together, you, you will see safer job sites forever now. The hand stations, it, you know, not just for COVID, for everything. We weren't always the cleanest on jobs. Porta potties clean, job sites, safety. There's all kinds of collaboration. Even the suicide prevention, the toolbox, the talks, the calisthenics before. These are all new things because of COVID. Also. The, the training of all these new you know, careers that the infrastructure bill, there's, there's money in for, to recruit an African-American and Hispanic in disadvantaged areas who haven't seen this type of opportunity in the trades for a lot of bad reasons to overcome that. Training, mentoring, and to bring that workforce so that they have careers in this industry safely. So there is a tremendous amount of positive. And, uh, and St. Patrick's Day is right on the horizon, but I don't think I'm going to drink because I think I might get that COVID long COVID. Everything, uh, <laughs> everything you said there, I'm like, oh, I might have had that one. So, so but uh, that's my positive. Craig, Denise, would you like to add to that? The only thing I would add is, is that if there's something that, that could be a positive out of this, this whole situation is the idea that you don't have to be a hero. Like, if you're sick, stay home. Don't go into the office and, and get 50 other people sick. Um, you know, it used to be if you were sick, you went in, you toughed it out. Uh, but if you're in close quarters with other people, uh, stay home, be well. We're looking for the silver lining, is that it? Okay. <laughs> so I would say the silver lining with COVID is definitely a, 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 an absolute intense focus uh, on safety. And, and um, that will help so many other areas. Um, I, you know, safety has always been a critical, um, important 
uh, role for, for Albertson's companies, but you know, we have got at the highest level, at the executive level, a focus on safety that we have never had before. And I think that, I would say, is definitely a silver lining because it's going to help us in many other ways, not just with COVID mitigation. Great, thank you. Why don't we open it up for questions from the audience? There are two mics here, please come up. And before you ask a question, please make sure you identify yourselves and the company or organization you are with. Do you have any questions? Hi, thanks very much. Joe Peduta, Health Strategy Associates. Terrific panel, really um, enjoyed it. Um, Dan, a question for you. Um, <clears throat> construction labor fraud has been and continues to be a, a really significant problem. And I'm, I'm very disappointed that the workers' compensation insurers have not done an awful lot more to ally with the construction trades and the, the construction folks who are doing the right thing to, to crack down on that, so my opinion. Um, have you seen an increase or a decrease in construction labor fraud during or after or, or I shouldn't say after, during this COVID situation, or have you seen that evolve? And if you have, if you could sort of indicate what you think is driving that. And then lastly, if you could suggest or, or uh, help folks in the audience who work for insurers to think about what they could do to combat construction fraud, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, it, <clears throat> it's a great question and it's a huge problem in the industry. Um, so I think it was Bob talked about the gig workers and the underground economy. Well, that's, that's what, you know, IT and all that. But in our industry, it's, it's, it's contractors, scrupulous contractors that cheat to compete. They hire workers, they go to gas stations in the, in the cities, they got people out there that can speak three different, they take advantage of of immigrants, they can speak three, four different languages, they come on, they put them into construction jobs, they're not skilled, they're not trained, they, there is no workers comp in them. If they're hurt, they call them misclassified workers, give them a, a, a pay stub, and, and then the, the legitimate contractor that is training and competing right and following every OSHA and investing in safety, it loses that as well as the, these workers become a substandard. In the right to work for less states, that's what's happening. They pull up, what are you making? They grab them and they just, they're disposable workers instead of careers in this industry. This is a high tech industry. There are fire in this building, you guys are worrying and I'm going, uh uh, fire and the elevators are coming down, dampers are closed, fire doors are open, the sprinkler, the fire department knows it's on four west before they pull out. That's because it's highly trained, highly skilled and that's what you, want to keep it. But I've often thought, why do they get away with that workers' comp fraud? Well, how is there a way to end that misclassification or end those contractors that misclassify, even though you come to one, two, three, fly by night construction every day and report in, their, in, in a truck? And the, and the bad part is, well, I was a former chief electrical assistant building commissioner. I saw what happens. People think, well, there's rules and permits and inspections. There's 60,000 inspections and, 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 and there's this many people to do it. So it, it, it goes uninspected and the fatalities I saw, the depositions, that's why I left that job. I couldn't take any more depositions of seeing somebody fatally injured or people's buildings ruined because of substandard work like that. So it's a great question and I don't know how to combat it, but we're trying. Other questions? Well, while folks are th still thinking, we have a few questions that were posed on the Whova app, so I will direct them to, uh, to our panel speakers. One of the first questions is, just as I try to end our conversation on a positive note, what are the positive impacts on the industry as a whole? I'm not sure if you would like to further elaborate on what we learned, what is positive as a, as a lesson learned. <clears throat> well, I would say that it definitely has, you know, lit a fire under us in terms of, I mean, the workers' comp industry in general in, in terms of technology advancements, pu pushing uh, telehealth. You know, we kind of had that, uh, you know, percolating on the back burner for years, but 
no real execution, and you know, obviously this forced our hand to utilize medical resources in different ways that I don't think we would have ever gotten there without this. And then, um, you know, in, in terms of just claims, um, you know, using technology and, and AI more efficiently to yeah. um, manage claims as well as resources, so. Correct. Yeah, I'd agree, and I'd say uh, that um, it, it taught us how to drop and roll very quickly. You know, very quickly, you took uh, uh, adjusters who were used to getting a history about an orthopedic kind of injury and very quickly uh, trying to understand, um, did someone have COVID? Uh, where did they get it? They, be, they became mini contract tracers because contract tracing really wasn't getting done in the community the, the way it should have been. Um, so personally, I, I'm very proud of what I saw from, from the people that worked at, that work at Liberty Mutual um, in, in getting, getting that job done. Thank you. Another question was, um, a very specific question. How can the knowledge of handling claims while interacting with coworkers be passed on in a virtual environment? How can the... How can the knowledge of handling claims while interacting with coworkers be passed on in a virtual environment? So at, at Liberty Mutual, we have a pretty strong emphasis right now uh, on, on training. Um, myself and uh, our other uh, uh, national, our national and regional medical directors uh, are filming uh, videos. Um, I have to admit, HD is not my friend, um, <laughs> but you know we're we're, we're filming videos about a, a variety of medical s subjects, so that uh, new and even uh, older case handlers. Uh, seasoned case handlers um, know about a variety of medical issues. We've increased training. Uh, we've increased um, a role called onboarding specialists. So we have people who, you know, are dedicated to make sure that that our new employees understand what it, what they're supposed to do and what they are doing. Thank I would you. say, I would add to that though, is you can be in person and not engaged. You can right. sit in your cubicle and do right. your thing. And it just, I mean, it takes effort to have things in place that encourage team members to engage and to um, uh, collaborate together. And so putting um, programs in place that emphasize that, um, you know, we use um, uh, a a program called Double Play, where our uh, claims professionals will, will sit around and, and, and strategize about a particular, uh, a particular claim, and any claims professional or nurse can bring a case to Double Play, and usually the nurse, the examiner, the attorney, they're all involved. They continue that process while working remotely. It's not, you know, at first it was harder to get people to start talking um, because they were used to sitting around a table, but, um, I think as soon as people got used to seeing each other on camera and in an environment that wasn't um, the office, you know, people became more, more comfortable with that. But I think you have to put things in place that encourage people to collaborate. It's not going to just happen with them sitting in their homes. Yeah. yeah. No, in the, uh, like, I'll, you know, just piggyback on that, the collaboration and the, uh, I, you know, the uh, AI has been great resource for getting us into the um, diverse communities. So a lot of people, first off, are afraid of the math test, this or that, if you hadn't had math in a while. So we have tutors online. We've got this, you know, uh, Chicago Teachers Union, different groups, volunteer to tutor. You can ask questions and line up for a tutor so you're not embarrassed in the online class if you don't know. And it's just reaping great success and confidence so that when they take the entrance test, they're doing Excellent, and then we have other groups. We're recruiting women. We got women in trade support groups, and we've got different groups. So 
like you said, the collaboration and using IT where you can do at night or in the day and then do you know, different collaboration is huge and building confidence that somebody can come into an industry that they may never have thought about or had the opportunity and it's working. We're, we're, we're seeing a huge amount of increased you know, people uh, into the careers, into the trade and it's heartwarming from uh, disadvantaged areas and I, my hope is they'll recruit the next generation as well. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Hearing none, this concludes our session. Thank you.